I'm Rachel Gottbaum, and this is Intention to Treat, a podcast from the New England Journal of Medicine. My name is Sarah. I am 32 years old, and I am a research scientist for the U.S. government. In July 2017, I was going for a bike ride when a car cut into the bike lane in front of me, and I ended up colliding with a light post head-on and fractured my spine, broke a rib, concussion, torn tendons, the whole thing. For weeks after her accident, Sarah was completely bedridden. When she finally started moving, she was in a lot of pain. And as the months wore on, her pain continued. She couldn't exercise, and getting through her PhD program became grueling. Sarah was debilitated, and she became very depressed. And when her birthday rolled around, she questioned whether it was worth going on. I couldn't imagine a future that would look like it was worth living. You know, you should be celebrating another year of life. (laughs) I was just feeling completely done with mine. And then she heard about a clinical trial taking place for people with severe depression, people like her. It was a trial that involved using psilocybin, the same drug as in hallucinogenic mushrooms. Sarah had never taken drugs, but she was willing to try just about anything. And I can unequivocally say that this clinical trial changed my life. This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Coming up, we'll find out more about that clinical trial that helped give Sarah her life back. But first, I'm joined by NEJM Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Rubin. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Rachel. So, Eric, let's talk about the field of using psychedelics to treat depression and other mental health problems. Give us a little background. Well, the idea of using psychedelics is really quite old. In fact, after the invention of LSD, it became very popular to apply psychedelics to a lot of different mental illness states. There were a lot of studies, honestly not very high quality ones, but some of them suggested that there might be some benefit. But the line between what was a therapeutic use of the drug and was more recreational was kind of blurry. So in the late 1960s, the federal government decided that LSD was a drug of abuse, and that pretty much shut down the research on using psychedelics in mental illness. So now they're having this renaissance of using and researching psychedelics to treat all sorts of mental health issues, alcoholism, PTSD, eating disorders. The journal has published two studies. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of those? A couple of years ago, we published a study of psilocybin, which is a molecule derived from hallucinogenic mushrooms and its use in depression. That study compared psilocybin with one of the commonly used antidepressants, escitalopram, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an SSRI. The question was, is there a difference in the activity of psilocybin and the SSRI? And the answer was really not very much. They both had about the same degree of benefit in patients. So that was really a negative study. It didn't prove that psilocybin was superior to the SSRI. There were some findings, though, in the study which suggested it might be better, and the study was very small. So it's kind of difficult to tell how much promise this has. And more recently, you published a much larger study. It was considered the largest of its kind. And that study showed that using a synthetic psilocybin compound did help patients with depression? Well, this was a phase two study. And it's important to remember that, that it's still, even though it was relatively large, it's still not asking in the most rigorous way. And the reason why it wasn't the most rigorous way is that rather than comparing two effective drugs to try to figure out which one was more effective or if they were equally effective, this compared an active dose of psilocybin with a very tiny dose, which is presumably has no activity, essentially a placebo. So we're comparing psilocybin to nothing. And so that's a very different study from the one we just discussed. 
Yes, and despite the lack of real placebo, there were some significant findings. Yeah, it did work. There certainly was an improvement in the participants who took the highest dose of psilocybin, not so much an intermediate dose. But at the high dose, there was a pretty reasonable response, the kind of response you tend to see in trials of antidepressants. So psychiatric studies in and of themselves are a real challenge, but using psychedelics is an uber challenge to study. Talk about how you navigate this. It's very difficult to do these studies. Remember that in many studies, whether there are physical diseases or of psychiatric illnesses, there is a placebo effect. And that's particularly true in psychiatric disease where the outcomes are very subjective. Now, add on top of that psychedelics, where it's almost impossible to do a double-blinded study. Because after all, when you take a psychedelic, you know it. So we have two groups of people in this study, those who had hallucinations and those who did not. And the people with hallucinations did better, but of course, they knew they were getting something that was thought to be an active drug. So it makes these studies extremely difficult. So then how do you square with that and decide what to publish? And then how does the field move forward given these challenges? Our goal is to publish the best information available in an area. And it's impossible to do the perfectly controlled study. Depression is a very important disease. It affects a very large number of people and it has a major impact on the quality of life of not just patients, but those around them. So I think we're very invested in seeing progress in the area, and this is the best you can do. Now, as far as this particular study goes, it's still a phase two study. It doesn't compare how this does as compared to more traditional treatments like SSRIs. We really do need to see those studies to see if we are going to be able to apply this kind of treatment widely. But that's not really possible, is it, Eric? I think it is possible to make the comparison. Admittedly, with all of the drawbacks that we discussed, people who take hallucinogens are going to know it. Having said that, we still can get outcomes just as we did in the earlier study we published. And we can make comparisons if we design the study to make those comparisons rigorously. And we want to encourage investigators to be doing the most high quality trials possible. And do so with the understanding that they may not be equivalent in design to some of the things that we can publish in physical medicine. However, they're important and we want to be there and try to advance this field. So what would you like to see moving forward given these challenges that you're describing? What needs to happen here, say, to bring these psychedelics to to the FDA for approval for medications? I'm not sure that our goal is to get FDA approval for drugs like this. Our goal is to try to inform a practitioner to help them make the decision as to whether or not this is going to be effective for their patient. And I think we can do that. Right now, a lot of the evidence that's accumulated over decades is small numbers of case reports or case series, and they're just not very persuasive. We need good quality clinical trials. And I think Trials like the one that we published here are getting us there. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Rachel, my pleasure. Back in the 1950s and 60s, scientists ran clinical trials of psychedelics of all kinds, like LSD, so-called magic mushrooms, MDMA. But by about 1969, that research was essentially banned by the federal government. These drugs are illegal. More recently, the FDA has been allowing research to take place, and there are now more than 200 clinical trials going on. Many of those are trying to find out whether these hallucinogenic compounds can be used to treat depression. We heard earlier from Sarah, who took part in a clinical trial using psilocybin at Johns Hopkins, and she joins me now. Sarah, remind us what happened. You were in a PhD program when you got into a major bike accident. You were bedridden for quite some time in a lot of pain, and you became very depressed and even suicidal. Yeah, so before I started the trial, I would say that I was feeling really dissociated from my body, from other people. I was feeling 
really alone inside my own head. And I was feeling extremely frustrated with what I felt like was maybe not a lack of progress, but just not as much progress as I had wanted to make with my physical recovery after the bike accident. So Sarah, can you describe what your thinking was like then? I think it's a commonality in a lot of depressive and and anxious people that there's sort of like this negative feedback loop of incessant kind of mind chatter where it doesn't matter what time of the day it is, what you're doing, your brain just kind of like keeps looping and being down on yourself, like thinking back to things in the past that you could have done better. And I I think that a lot of people with depression and anxiety experience that, that ceaseless negative chatter in the brain. To me, I kind of see these, these thought processes, they're kind of like sled tracks down a hill. And you've formed these tracks and they become the path of least resistance, right? No matter what therapist comes in and logically tells you that, that these thought patterns are not helpful to you, that they might be hurting you, they inevitably end up as the pathway of least resistance. So your mind just constantly wants to go back to that pathway, even though it's a self-destructive pathway, even though it's not helping you, it doesn't help you move forward. You, you end up stuck in this loop. I'm wondering about medications for your depression. Did you have any experience with those? I stopped the Prozac because I felt like it had sort of served its purpose for me. It had helped me through the the most acute depressive episode of my life. It had helped me overcome that period. And I was at a point where it was just sort of making me numb and even more tired than I had been previously. So I felt like it was time to stop it. From that point forward, I continued on with talk therapy, and I heard about the study that was going on right under my nose, right at Johns Hopkins. And Sarah, you joined this clinical psilocybin trial, and we will hear about that in a moment. But first, I want to bring in Professor Roland Griffiths. He's the founder and director of the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins, where your trial took place. Professor Griffiths, you have dedicated your career studying these hallucinogenic compounds. Why? Rachel, I've I've been doing research at Johns Hopkins in clinical psychopharmacology for, it's it's actually half a century now, 50 50 years. And my early research was focused on drug abuse pharmacology. About 25 years ago, I undertook a meditation practice. And that got me deeply curious about these unique altered states of consciousness that can open up in meditation. And as I read the literature, uh, it appeared that they might have some relationship to what happens with psychedelics. So I became intrigued about the possibility of initiating a research trial. And in this case, it was with psilocybin, and it was the first approvable trial to, uh, that's FDA and DEA, allowed to go forward in healthy volunteers, what we showed was that a single dose of psilocybin when given under highly supported conditions, and this was to healthy volunteers who had never before experienced a psychedelic drug, that single experience produced what we loosely call a transcendent or mystical type experience. But more importantly, Months after that single dose, our participants reported large positive changes in attitudes, moods, and behavior. And in particular, what was so striking is that they found the experience to be deeply personally meaningful, so much so that many volunteers rated it either the most meaningful experience of their entire lifetime or among the top five most meaningful. I had never seen anything of that sort. Most drugs that produce large subjective effects, like a dose of alcohol or a sedative hypnotic, people are aware their sense of reality changes, but a day later, it's just a memory. What's different about the psychedelics 
is that there's something about that experience that's deeply encoded and remembered, and it elicits this sense of deep personal meaning. It appears that we're looking at brain processes and potential mechanisms that that are we're biologically wired for. And it appears that drugs like psilocybin under the appropriate conditions can be optimized to produce such effects. So we have conducted a series of studies a- across now several different therapeutic indications. So tell us about some of these studies. Our first study was conducted in people who were depressed or anxious secondary to having a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. So these were people who were very seriously depressed or anxious. And that first study, which was published in 2016, showed that a single dose of psilocybin produced these enormous decreases in both anxiety and depression that we followed out to six months after a single dose. And a a New York University, they conducted a very similar study and have since followed those people out to five years. So that's just astonishing within the field that a single intervention, something that occurs in a single afternoon over maybe a six-hour period, can produce these large and enduring effects. As well, we have done studies in the addictions showing that psilocybin decreases relapse to cigarette smoking among people who are addicted to smoking. Very recently, there was a publication showing that psilocybin is effective in treatment of alcoholism. We're launching a study in opiate users. I know of studies going on in cocaine users and in cannabis users. So one of the very interesting features is that this intervention may have broad cross-diagnostic generality. In other words, it works for various kinds of psychiatric conditions. And, and that's largely unprecedented within the field of psychiatry. There's something going on at this larger level of brain function and meaning making that we, we simply don't understand well at all. And we don't have good neural models for understanding it. And so my career since that first study has been unpacking what that means, how that comes about, what its implications are, this unique profile of changes in thoughts and perceptions and emotions that are often experienced as deeply meaningful and for which people sometimes make enduring life changes thereafter. Sarah, I want to bring you back in. When you did the psilocybin trial, a big part of that was working with therapists for many months who helped you process your experience. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So initially you have a few meetings with your the individuals who will be your guides. Mary and Alan uh, were my guides. So it's it feels something like going to talk therapy where you're meeting with them and you're discussing what you feel like are the biggest hurdles that you're facing, the the struggles, what's what's kind of holding you back and where your mind is at lately. So in, in that way, it felt like a typical kind of talk therapy thing for me, um, which made it approachable. It was just, you know, that I had two therapists essentially instead of one. But where it really started to depart was the level of trust that you have with your therapists is much greater than I've had in a a very long time. So for me to to be willing to try something that was that I I knew kind of going in was going to be um maybe a, a tough experience, maybe a scary experience. I had to trust the people that I was working with. And that was huge for me. So describe to us a little bit what the trial was actually like. 
So the the first session that I had, so when I use the word session, I'm referring specifically to those dates where I actually received psilocybin. I would explain it to people as feeling like I was in this boat on a still and calm, just endless, velvety black ocean with just innumerable stars above my head and reflecting in the water. And I'm just loosely moored to this dock and with each song, I'm proceeding out and away from that dock and away from the the dock of my body basically and just going really deep inside of myself It wasn't like I was having a conversation in my head. It was like I was just feeling my way through things. Everyone hurts. Everyone's heart breaks and they struggle. And I feel like that experience was just, yeah, an an incredible counterpoint to that. Having this experience was healing for me because it addressed a question and a fear, like a deep-seated fear that I had had for so many years that I'm utterly alone. And that's that's just, it's terrifying. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> so it seems like you felt more connected and no longer alone after this trial with psilocybin. I would say the therapeutic intervention on its own, the the chemical intervention specifically is, it was an incredible tool, but if I had only had that in a vacuum, I don't know how helpful it would have been. I have always said that the psilocybin and the talk therapy were both necessary, but neither is sufficient on its own as a therapeutic intervention. What I needed was both in combination. What I needed was the incredible level of support and trust that was built inside of this clinical trial with my guides, with Mary and Alan. That that work that we did in the days and weeks coming out of my sessions to integrate my experiences, to better understand them and better see how I could use them to inform how I perceive my own life and how I look at my own life and how I go forward in my life. As I listen to Sarah describe her experience, I'm wondering, Professor Griffiths, if you can speculate about what may be happening biologically here. So here's what we know about how these drugs work. The psychedelics, what they have in common is that they bind a subtype of serotonin receptors and they bind that receptor And then they produce changes at the cellular level. That then results in how different neurons connect with other neurons, where you have different areas of brain that talk to one another. And that whole pattern of normal brain functioning seems to be disrupted. And the idea is that broken networks, things that are stuck essentially, and, and again, I point to Sarah talking about she felt like she was in a track of an obsessive way of thinking about things, that these, these tracks can, can change. And so that's the thought, that the brain may be able to reconnect in healthier ways. There's a resetting. It's almost like the analogy of a computer being rebooted after it's gotten stuck But I think the point I would emphasize is that whatever is happening is happening at a basic neuronal and brain mechanism level, but as well, it's happening at this larger psychological level at which people have changes in their worldview and they can rewrite the narratives around their lives. And I think the most humbling piece of this is that the, the changes in subjective effects are really changes in consciousness. And we have such a poor understanding about what consciousness is. So that underscores the fact that this may, in fact, be an insoluble problem. 
the consciousness refers to what an experience feels like. And how to explain that in terms of neural function is a, a deep, deep mystery. And can you tell us briefly about the risks of using these drugs? There are two types of risks that are of most concern. The first is that people may engage in dangerous behavior when under the influence of a psychedelic. These experiences can be very disorienting, and without close supervision, some people may become confused or deeply fearful, and they may engage in dangerous behavior both to themselves or to others. Confused individuals may walk into traffic or otherwise put themselves in dangerous situations, including, in extreme cases, jumping from buildings or from other heights under the confused belief that the laws of gravity no longer apply to them. The second kind of risk from exposure to a psychedelic is that it can result in the onset of new psychiatric conditions, including enduring symptoms of anxiety or depression, or worse still, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. In the very worst case, it's thought that a single moderate high dose of a psychedelic can precipitate the debilitating lifelong illness of schizophrenia in vulnerable individuals. It's for these reasons that investigators conducting trials with psychedelics carefully monitor participants when they're under the influence of a psychedelic, and they also carefully screen and attempt to exclude prospective participants if they have vulnerabilities to certain psychiatric conditions. Sarah, you really benefited from this trial. What has life been like for you since then? I can honestly say the first 12 months after that clinical trial, my brain just felt so different. It was just a, such a different place for my consciousness to inhabit. It was just so much quieter in there and a lot more peaceful. I continue to carry this idea and the sense of connectedness with me throughout life. I feel like the long-term gift that this clinical trial has given me is that it has provided me with a tool in the way that talk therapy never did on its own. I feel like I have this place that I can go back to in my mind of just like calm, present acceptance of what I'm experiencing. I always come back to the music that we listen to in the session. And I feel like that, that music gives me such a quick way back to that new way of thinking, different way of thinking. That I'm part of something valuing myself and having empathy for myself that just helps me to keep moving no matter what's going on in life. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Professor Griffiths. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Rachel. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. That's Professor Roland Griffiths. He's director of the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins, and also Sarah. She participated in a trial there using psilocybin to treat depression. You're listening to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Next time, Dr. Anthony Fauci has spent his entire career fighting for what he believes in, and that sometimes has made him a target. It was near the end of the dinner, and I said, Tony, I've got, I've got some bad news. <laughs> we've got these demands. We've been talking to you about them for a few months now, but we've seen no results. So we're going to demonstrate at the NIH and we're going to surround your building. 
with the full intent of putting Tony between a rock and a hard place. That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gopin.